Hey, Bethany needs you in 2022. That's our theme. Last week we talked about Bethany needs you to believe in the Lord, to believe in His Word, <clears throat> and to believe in His church. And we talked all about that last week. This week our theme is Bethany needs you to pray. And so in your bulletin there was a little green church card. It looks something like that. We want you to fill that out on this first song. Well, we're going to be singing in a moment. We want you to fill that out. And then I'm going to have two ushers come and collect those prayer requests. Now, fill that out. If it's a private, don't turn it in. Wait to the end of the service and put it in the offering plates by the door. But if you have a prayer request today, because we are in this service, we are going to pray for those requests. Now, for those of you who couldn't make it today and you're online, if you're online, you can go to the webpage where you found this service streaming and you'll see that there are some dialog boxes below that for your name and information and then you put your prayer request in there. But please be sure and add your name onto that because if you'll send that in right now, while the service is going on, actually in the next few minutes, there's a little lag time between what you're watching online and what you're seeing here of about a minute, minute and a half, two. But if you'll fill that out now and you will hit the send button, it's a black little button at the bottom that turns into send when you put your cursor over it, it'll go right to my phone. I better go silence my phone. All right. <laughs> but it'll go to my phone and then when it comes to our prayer time, we will pray for your request too. All right, so we want you to do that. Now, this is the first time we've tried that, so there may be a hiccup, but please, if you have a prayer request today, you send that. Now, listen, if you're logging in to watch this at 3 in the afternoon or tomorrow, uh, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to go retro in time, and so you need to do that immediately. Do that now. We ask you all to do that now. Hey, I want to go over our memory verse. How many are learning our memory verse? How many have said it at least once in the last week? How about last Sunday? Yeah, we said it twice last Sunday. Okay, so <laughs> you're good. You're good. So we're going to all quote this together. Let's say it together. First That's Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. That's why we've been saying, Bethany, needs you in 2022. You are a part of the body of Christ. Bethany Church is the body of Christ. So we need you. We're, gonna, we're having prayer in the house of the Lord. In fact, we need to pray in the house of the Lord. Uh, there's a prayer in the Bible that was in the house of the Lord. And I want to just go over that for a moment before we pray for our prayer cards. The King Hezekiah had encountered a real problem. I don't know if you've ever had a problem in life, but he's got a life-threatening problem. It says, In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked at the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Then the king of Assyria sent his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. Here's the picture. Uh, King Sennacherib of the Assyrians has just been like a roller machine, just rolling over every nation that comes in his presence. And he is now focused on the land of Israel, and he is capturing and destroying all the cities, the fortified cities, that are to, out to protect the capital city of Jerusalem. So he's rolled over the last of them, Lachish, and now he's going for the prize, Jerusalem, and King Hezekiah is in Jerusalem and 185,000 Assyrians are gathered around the city. In fact, from uh, archaeology, they have discovered the stela or prison that says Sennacherib's siege resulted in Hezekiah being shut up in Jerusalem like a caged bird. He had him like a bird in a cage. The city of Jerusalem, he's got him surrounded. He can't, you can't go in, you can't go out. And he's, we know from even secular accounts that Hezekiah is in dire situation. In fact, he has sent his field commander to speak in the language they understood Hebrew. And he said, surely you have heard what the king of Assyria has done 
to the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? He is threatening, antagonizing him. He even goes so far as to say, your God sent me to do this. I mean, come on, where is your God? He's not protected you from uh, me attacking all your other cities. He sent me. He's antagonizing him. And so Isaiah the prophet finds out, and and, and he tells the king not to be afraid. Don't be afraid. Hezekiah receives a letter from him and from the messengers and he reads the letter and it has all these threats in it. Who's been able to stand before me? There's no nation. How are you going to do it? Are you going to lean on Egypt, that broken reed? He says things like this and he is just baiting him and he's trying to destroy their confidence. And so when King Hezekiah read it, He then went into the temple of the Lord. He went into the house of the Lord. And he spread it out before the Lord. And then the text says in the very very next verse, And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, almighty God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent in insult to the living God. He's a blasphemer, O God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to all these peoples and their lands. And I skipped down just a little bit in this prayer. And it says, And now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you alone are God. At that time, Isaiah the prophet interrupts everything in the the discourse there, and he says, uh, this is what it says, therefore, this is what the Lord says. Isaiah's a prophet. God has given him his word. He says, this is what God says. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. (laughs) Now imagine. There is 185,000 in an army surrounding the city. If even just a quarter of them, okay, just a quarter, are archers. I mean, they had spearsmen and they had those that were, you know, ramp builders and all of that, so... But just a quarter of them are archers. And each one of them has a dozen arrows. I mean, would you go into battle with less? If you've got a dozen arrows in your quiver, that's over half a million arrows. And God says to Isaiah, go tell the king, not one single arrow is coming over the wall against you. Now, is that amazing? Hey, I mean, some guy's not even going to go out and practice his shot. No, not one arrow is coming over uh, the wall. Because that night it says, then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all dead bodies. Wow. Can our God answer prayer? Can our God answer prayer? When you come into the house of the Lord and you just lay it before the Lord, our God can answer your prayer. And that's what we've done today. We've invited you to come into the house of the Lord to fill out your prayer request. And we're going to have a time right now. Tina is going to come. He's going to lead us in the prayers that were collected here. And I'm going to pray for those that were brought in online. Come, Tina, lead us in the prayers for our people. Sweet hour of prayer that we've just sung about takes time. Takes time. You know, the, the, the reference is the sweet hour of prayer. And uh, it says in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 3, verse 1, I have the English Standard Version here. It says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Well, hour of prayer, I had to find a translation that still had the term hour of prayer because most translations put that as time of prayer. 
because it was an idiom that was used, hour of prayer, not for 60 minutes, so to speak, that, hey, you didn't qualify if your prayer didn't last 60 minutes long. But uh, what it means is it was the hour on the clock, the clock hour of prayer. And there just so happened to have been three different times for prayer in the temple. The first uh, hour of prayer was actually at 9 o'clock in the morning. It was called the third hour of prayer, the third. Why was it the third? Because from the time the sun came up, three hours later, it comes up at six, kind of universally, and, and then it, at, at the third hour, it was actually their first hour of prayer at 9 a.m. The second hour of prayer was at uh, then the, the sixth hour, which would actually be at noon. So there was a prayer time at nine, there's a prayer time at noon, and there was a prayer time at the ninth hour, which would have been at 3 p.m., three in the evening. Now, this kind of coincides with a custom that we have. I pray before breakfast, I pray at lunch, and I pray at dinner, right? And so three times a day, I'm saying a prayer. But it wasn't just, hey, rub-a-dub-dub, bless this grub, yay God. No. They were praying real prayers, okay? Not just thank you, Lord, for the food, amen. They were taking and they were going through their prayer list. And so it was the, the three in the afternoon, the disciples don't have church buildings yet, so they go into the house of the Lord. They go into the temple. They go to the temple, and there they're going to have their prayer meeting. At the same time, all the Jews are having their prayer meeting, and a man, a leper, or, I mean, a man who is lame from birth was being carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple that was called the beautiful gate to ask of alms for those entering the temple. Think about it. We come to church and once a month we have a helping hands fund. This guy was wanting a helping hand. He knew that people who were going to, to church or the temple were charitable and he was going to actually ask for them to extend some charity towards him and, and give him something at that time. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive some alms. He said, hey, buddy, you got something for me? He's in need. Peter directed his gate at him, his gaze at him, as did John, and they said, look at us. You see, he's got his hand out, and he's probably talking to him, but he's got his hand out. You know how, how they do? And, and, and he said, look at us. He says, fix, and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Okay, what do you got for me? <laughs> I'm ready to take it. And this is what he said. Peter said to them, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Whew. This guy went to the temple that day in order to ask for some financial help, and instead of getting a few, uh, you know, talents of silver or gold, getting something, he took him by the right hand, Peter took this man by the right hand, and he raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Luke is the one who records this. Luke was a physician, and when the miracle took place, he notices God healed from the inside out. His ankles were made strong and immediately his feet, the man could walk leaping and you can read the rest of the story in the book of Acts. Wow. He went to the house of the Lord asking for alms and he got healing. Is that amazing? Is that amazing? There's power in asking for what you need in the house of the Lord. I want to talk about not just a sweet hour of prayer, I want to talk about the semi-sweet hour of prayer. He said, semi-sweet hour of prayer, what in the world is that? Well, if you go back in the Old Testament, Daniel was a man of God. From the time he was a teenager and was taken away into Babylon and he was emasculated physically and he was put into the king's service, he still loved the Lord God with all his heart. And he would not turn his heart from God. He is now 80 years old, 
and he's gone through a few kings, King Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, now he's working on King Darius. He's, you know, he's outlived their ministries, and it's King Darius. And King Darius really likes Daniel, because Daniel is a, a mighty man in his administration. And, and, but the other royal administrators, they could not stand Daniel. There's something about being a godly person that just ungodly people don't like. You don't have to do anything wrong or bad. They don't like that you are righteous and doing good. They just don't like that. And these administrators agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to the king, should be thrown in the lion's den. You know this story from Sunday school, don't you? <laughs> so the king puts it the, the law into decree, not knowing that these guys are actually got a coup against Daniel. They want him to stop praying. So now Daniel learned, this is important, that the decree had been published, and he went home to his upstairs room where the window opened towards Jerusalem. There it is, three times a day. I got to believe it was at 9 o'clock, noon, and 3 o'clock. I think this might be where the tradition comes from. He gets down on his knees. That's what the text says. He takes a posture of prayer. You know, sometimes they stand raising their hands to God. Sometimes they're on their knees. Sometimes they lay flat out. You know how it is when you're sick in bed. You're not getting out on your knees. You just lay flat out and you pray to God. You know what I'm saying? He got down on his knees to humble himself before God and he gave thanks. What? I'm living now in jeopardy of my life because I have to obey God rather than man. I have to pray rather than not pray. So he gives thanks. God, you put me in these circumstances. <laughs> God, you got to get me out. <laughs> Thank you, God. You give thanks in all things. And what the scriptures say? Thank you, God, for the difficult times I'm in. So he gives thanks to his God, just as he had done before, always giving thanks. And then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking for help. I like that. You see, what's going on here is he thanks God first, and then he asks for help. I like that. I like the order. He gives thanks first, and then he asks for help. So the king gave his order, because it was a law that could not be revoked. And they brought Daniel, and they threw him in the lion's den. But the king, the king says to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. You see, he got caught in his own laws, because he could not revoke the law. He had to go through with it, and he throws him in there, but he regrets that he ever signed the law, because he loves Daniel. And so he hastens home at the first light of dawn. The next day, the king got up and he hurried to the lion's den where he came near the den and he called out, Daniel! In an anguished voice, he says, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And you know from your childhood story, Daniel answered, O king, live forever. O king, live forever. God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. You know why I call this semi-sweet? Because when he's first making that prayer request, things are really pretty bitter. <laughs> Here's a man that prayed every day, three times a day, and things did not go well. And then he continued to pray and finally, they take him out of the lion's den. And in his place, they throw all those guys who had tried to get him dead in the lion's den. It was back on them, back on them. Listen, for a prayer time right now, in a moment I have Pastor Dave come up to give thanks and ask for help. This is nothing unusual. We, we teach our children to do this. Say please and thank you, don't we? Now, in the Bible, it's just the opposite. Say thank you and please. 
And so we're going to ask Pastor Dave. He's going to come and he's going to pray. Uh, for the dire situation we find ourselves here in America, in church, in our communities, he's going to say, hey, thank you, Lord. And then he's going to say, this is what we need, O oh Lord. He's going to pray. Come, Dave, pray for us. Prayer is war. I don't know if you ever thought about it. Prayer is war. Prayer is war. And because it is, God says, therefore... Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. He says this, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. He says, With the breastplate of righteousness in place. He goes on and he says, And your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. He goes on and says, in addition to all this, take the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Woo! Think of Hezekiah again. Half a million arrows out there. It could have, be, could have been dipped with flames and fired at him. And he laid it out before the Lord. Listen, prayer is powerful. He said, take the shield of faith with which... When those come hurling in, your faith will deflect and extinguish them, all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of your salvation, he says, and the sword of the Spirit, and he says exactly what the sword of the Spirit is, the Word of God. That's why we've asked you to read the Bible every day. We have daily reading guides at, in the lobby for you to take. That's why we want you to learn the memory verse, okay? So that you have it for total recall. He's saying, take all of this because prayer is warfare because once you get all the equipment, this is what he says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers. Prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of petition, a, a prayers for healing, a, a prayer, and just go on. There's all kinds of prayers. Prayers of confession. He says, pray. Prayers of adoration, just to adore God. All kinds of prayers. And he says, and your request. With this in mind, be alert and keep on praying for all the saints. I recited not too long ago, I'm going to recite it again if I can recall it all, a little poem I learned in, in the Daily Bread. It goes like this. I had a battle fierce today within my place of prayer. I went to meet and talk with God, but I found Satan there. He said, you've lost out long ago. You may say words that are all on your knees, but you can't pray, you know. So then I pulled my, my so then I checked my armor or my, I, I lost it all there. I lost the poem. Can I start all over? Yeah. I had a battle fierce today. Within my place of prayer, I went to meet and talk with God, but I found Satan there. He said, you can't really pray. You lost out long ago. You may say words while on your knees, but you can't pray you know. So then I checked my, no, then I pu pulled my helmet down, way down upon my ears, and I found it helped to still his voice and helped to lay my fears. I checked my other armor or my feet in peace were shod, my loins with tr truth were girt about, my sword, the word of God. My righteous breastplate still was on, my heart's love to protect, my shield of faith was all intact, his fiery darts bounced back. So then I prayed in Jesus' name and I pled the precious blood while Satan snuck away in shame. I met and talked with God. Listen, I'm sorry I botched that poem, but it is a great poem. It is a great poem. We are in spiritual warfare. It is a battle. It is a battle. You see, our enemy is like, who is the devil? He is like a roaring lion. He's prowling around, looking for someone to devour. And if you are not equipped with the equipment God has given us, you are in easy prey. You need to arm up and pray. Not only that, it says, the God of this age, referring to Satan, Lower G God, he thinks he's a God, he's not. He's a God of this age. He's blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. They reject because they just 
don't see it. They're blinded by whom? The God of this age. He's trying to keep people in the dark. And so we have a spiritual war going on, and it is a war for souls. It is a war for souls. In Romans chapter 10, it says this, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. He's praying for salvation of those who are lost. He's praying that God would rip the blinders from their eyes so that they would see. He's, he's praying that they will get the helmet of salvation so that they understand the word of God, that, it, that Jesus is the Christ, the gospel. They'll make the confession with their mouth. They'll believe it in their heart and they'll trust in it like we talked about last week, a complete, genuine faith in Christ, that they will be saved, that they will be saved. He says, join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. He says, listen, I need your prayers too. It's okay to say to someone, pray for me. Paul's saying, pray for me as I'm praying for the Israelites and I'm preaching to the Israelites. I'm wanting them to come to Christ. Pray for me. There's a spiritual war going on for souls. You may know someone who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ. They may think they know, but they don't know him. They may be very religious, but never trusted in him. They may be totally against God, blinded and, and, and don't want any of the light. You can pray for that person that God will remove those blinders from their eyes and he'll have the light of the gospel penetrate all the way into their hearts so that they believe. There's also a spiritual war for our bodies, for our bodies. We, we've come to this several times and we're going to do it again today. Go to James where it says, Is any one of you sick? He should call on the elders of the church. Well, the elders of the church are the pastors of the church. And you got two. You got Pastor Dennis, Pastor Dave. There's two of us. Notice what it says. You are to call on the elders. It's not the elders' responsibility to track you down. You're supposed to call on the elders. Call on the elders of the church to pray over them, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. There's two words for anointing. One's a lapho and one is a... Christos, okay, we get the word Christ from it. Olepho is to use like medicine. You put oil on a wound. The, the man who was, uh, was uh, uh, attended to by the Good Samaritan poured oil and wine in his wounds. He was using uh, wine as an antiseptic, and he was using the oil as a medicinal oil to bring healing to his body. And then there's the other word, Christos, that the, Jesus the Christ is called the anointed one because they would sprinkle oil on the head of someone being, being um, anointed to an office of a priest or a king or a prophet. And they would anoint him and to inaugurate him into that ministry. The word here is not a ceremonial oil. It's not Christos, it's a lapho. What he's saying here is, hey, hey you pray over him while giving medicine medicine to him in the name of our Lord. So when I go, people call me, I find out somebody's in the hospital, I go to the hospital and, and I pray over them asking God to use every means available. They're at the hospital. The surgery, the medicine, the therapy. God use it because that's the medicine of our time. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Who? It's not even the person in the bed whose faith is looked at here. It's the elder's faith, the people praying over him. Their faith will make the person well, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has sinned, because some sickness is due to sin, it will be forgiven him. Obviously, there must be a confession involved in there. They confess their sin because God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to forgive us from all unrighteousness when we do that. Therefore, he says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. We have some oil here today, and we're going to call it anointing oil. And uh, it's nothing special. I'm not sure if I got this at Walmart 
or if I got it at the Kroger's, but there's nothing special about this oil. Because it's not the oil that makes a person well. Did you realize that? It's not all the medicines the doctors give, the surgeries. None of that can make you heal. Healing belongs to the Lord. So when we take an anointing oil like this, just a ceremonial oil, and we put it on a person's head to anoint them, it has no power whatsoever. But the prayer of faith, when we ask God, in faith believing, God will move into action. So why even use the oil? The oil says, Lord, I am declaring that I have no control over this. I am relying totally on you. And so when we sing our next song, as we sing that song, as it comes to a close, if you're interested, you've got something. You've got someone that you're praying for that God would open their eyes, a spiritual battle. And you want to be anointed and say, God, I am seriously praying that you will work in their hearts and life. Or you have some affliction and you're saying, hey, I have, you know, there's a connection between my spirit and my body, okay? There's a connection. Uh, whenever I do something wrong and it's exposed, I feel guilty my whole insides, I get depressed. And if I get depressed, my body can get sick. And so there's a connection there. And so when you come and, and, and we'll pray, we'll, we'll anoint with oil that God will answer whatever it is. Physical, spiritual, emotional, you pray. You let us know and we will pray for you. Okay, so we're going to sing this final song. And the song is uh, Word of God Speak. And as we sing, word of God, speak. It's kind of like, God, speak into my life. Speak, O oh God, with your victory.